The patient is the most important thing within the whole concept. The patient is the reason why we do what we do. We may have been a patient at some point in our life. We will have friends and relatives who are patients, have been patients. So we all have a vetted interest in making equipment better, making the patient experience in hospital better. So they, their outcomes, their experience needs to be positive. And if we can contribute to making their experience positive, then we've done a good job. Clinical studies are very important in uh, ensuring that patients get the appropriate treatment because it's the only way of knowing whether th those treatments are effective. So there are obviously new innovations that come on all the time, but we need to be sure that they're going to be a benefit to the patients. So having a clinical study that shows a significant benefit is a requirement really to make a change in practice. I think the NHS and every healthcare system around the world will need to embrace new technology and new innovation. I don't think we will be able to manage or afford healthcare without embracing innovation. Um, if you look at some of the fascinating mobile apps that are coming through at one end to discovering new molecules that are uh, implied in, in, in a clinical or disease pathway, you know, I think they all have a role and, and, and healthcare needs to embrace it. Yes, we need to find a way of how we can afford all these things, um, but I think hospital systems will need to embrace uh, new technology. The future of the healthcare sector relies heavily on new concepts and innovations, which ensures that patients are at the forefront of their service. Patient centricity is therefore vital within development of new solutions within this sector. New solutions and prospective techniques will ultimately ensure that the patient's requirements are met. It is hence important that the collaborative work of clinicians and solution developers is rigorous in order to provide new solutions which will be beneficial for patient health and treatments. Solutions such as the process of EIS, home monitoring for patients with cardiac implants, as well as TIVA are a few examples which are being implemented to ensure patient centricity within healthcare. Have to make sure that the patient is really at the forefront of your mind when you're developing products. Um, absolutely involve them when you're able to and if you can, um, but certainly the patient centricity is really the absolute focus of any healthcare system. It is all about trying to find out what's wrong with the patient, seeing if there's a way of diagnosing issues and looking at surgery where appropriate and that surgery using the best technologies that you can to give that patient the best experience that they can have and the best recovery uh, and the best, you know, the rest of their life that they can possibly have. Right from the very first conversation with the blank sheet of paper over a coffee table, talking to the surgeon and saying, you know, I noticed you were having problems with that particular aspect of the procedure. You needed three hands, you only had two. You know, what sort of things can we do to, to help alleviate those problems and alleviate those, those challenges? And if you do that right at the very beginning, then kind of the patient benefit really gets designed into the product. We need to ensure that the devices that are launched meet the needs of the physicians and meet the needs of the patients. And obviously that we have to deliver these at top quality um, as far as the practical side of that within the UK. We have a dedicated team in the UK that can support educationally and deliver the training in the field and take this out and ensure then that once the products meet the customer that they know that they've got the confidence of full customer service behind them. Within healthcare um, we, we work within a, a, a reg regulatory framework and, and rightly so um, I think it is incumbent on um, governments to make sure that their populations are safe when, when products are being used on them. And, and part of that is having good quality systems and, and, and not paying lip service to quality. You know, quality is absolutely key uh, for, for, I think, any business, but there's so much so in, in healthcare.
A lot of innovations that come out of the UK. Um, there's a lot of innovations um, that NICE will look at. Um, NICE is our you know, national uh, group uh, looking at medical technologies and they will look at you know, products that have been developed to see if there's a, a mechanism of getting them used uh, more quickly in the NHS. The other benefit that NICE has of course is it's an international brand uh, as is the NHS. Uh, so most markets that we go to that we say this product was developed in the NHS and has some kind of nice guidance associated with it or briefing document associated with it, that gives us uh, a lot of credibility uh, internationally. I think in this field, innovation is, it's there, it has to be. You know, innovation across the medical sector has moved us along so quickly with medical technology and digital technology. But there's certainly a, a very strong help with regards to innovation and uh, developing just, just new techniques and new approaches to how we can deliver the best services and the best solutions to current healthcare needs. Cancer is a significant issue within the global health space. For several decades, scientists have been trying to eradicate the disease from the human spectrum. One of the recently used solutions is the use of EIS, electrical impedance spectroscopy, to give a more thorough diagnosis of cervical cancer. The use of EIS provides a more accurate diagnosis and aids better patient management at first visit by providing immediate real-time results. The technique is EIS, it's electrical impedance spectroscopy and it involves applying very small currents to the tissue at different frequencies. Now you apply current and then you see how easily the current flows through the tissue. You measure the resistance to the flow of electricity. Now at low frequencies the current has to go round all the cells, yeah? whereas at higher frequencies it start, can start going through the cells. Um, so what that means is that you're getting information on the structure of the tissues because if the tissue has got layers of cells, if the cells are all tightly bound together, they block the passage of electricity, so the electricity at low frequencies is blocked, you get a high resistance. Um, if this layering starts breaking down or the gaps between the cells starts increasing, then your resistance will drop. So by getting an impedance spectrum, you get a measurement of tissue structure. Yeah? So you in, print, in principle, you can apply this anywhere where you want to know what is the localised structure of the tissue. Colposcopy hasn't changed since 1922 when it was first described by a German uh, gynaecologist who put acetic acid on the cervix and noticed areas went white. And we're now understanding that the whiteness is not a perfect test. Uh, things that go white are not necessarily CIN, and perhaps some CIN doesn't turn white at all. And as we now move into a new era of screening, when more and more women are being referred with low-grade abnormalities, colposcopy actually doesn't perform very well. So we're looking at new technologies to try and improve our detection of disease, but also, more importantly, prove to women that they don't have disease so they can be sent back to routine screening after initial examination. Traditionally, clinicians have relied on visual indicators. And, and the issue with these visual indicators is they're not disease-specific. And so it, it, it proves quite challenging sometimes for clinicians. Um, so here we're providing them with additional information in real time, um, and that helps um, the clinician to make that better judgment. Mainly because the colposcopy examination hasn't changed much since um, it was first introduced as an examination for the cervix. Um, we've always done things the same way and then we became aware that new technologies were being introduced to aid with the colposcopy examination. So we were quite keen as a large teaching hospital to um, you know, get on board with having a new piece of technology as an adjuvant to the colposcopy examination. One of the issues with, with the current system is that often um, with the visual indicators it, it leads to over-treatment. 
Um, and that's not surprising when, when you're re relying on visual indicators. So having an objective system to confirm that there is disease there, that gives you significant confidence in saying, yes, there is disease here and we will treat you immediately. And that means that you don't then have to have another appointment, which means you have to take time off work, it may involve childcare, all those sort of complications. It's nice to have immediate information to give the patient. Um, the benefits are that we are able to discharge patients sooner um, and have confirmation of normal colposcopy um, and to correlate that with your colposcopic opinion. It's always reassuring to us and to the patient uh, when, when we're discharging patients. The fact that it's quick and easy and straightforward and doesn't involve a big piece of unusual equipment in, in the room it is a benefit. Another recent development within healthcare is the use of TIVA. Using gas to put patients to sleep before surgery hasn't always been proven to be the safest technique. This prompted the scientists to look for new ways to achieve this effect without giving the patient unpleasant after effects. The method of TIVA has been implemented within the use of anaesthesia and analgesia. TIVA is a, a methodology uh, or an approach for uh, analgesia, uh, putting patients to sleep for, for operations. Historically, they would use a gas, works fine. Um, one of the challenges with that is the, uh, the post-operative uh, nausea and potential vomiting that patients can experience, which can last a few days. Uh, TIVA is fantastic because it has a very short half-life, uh, so when the drug is stopped being infused in the patient, they wake up very quickly, they become aware very quickly, invariably they ask for a cup of tea and then very shortly afterwards they're, they're going home, obviously depending on the type of procedure that they've had. One of the challenges with TIVA is if you get the infusion wrong, if you give too much drug or not enough drug, if you give too much drug then potentially the patient can stop breathing, go into cardiac arrest, or if you don't give enough drug, the patient will become aware in the operating room but not be able to actually articulate the, the, the fear that they're in because they can feel everything that's going on but they can't tell anyone about it. So what we did is uh, around 15 years ago work with a group of doctors in Scotland who were starting to develop uh, TIVA as a methodology for analgesia um, and looked at the problems that they have. So giving too much drug, not giving enough drug, having occlusions in the lines, so if you bend the line you prevent the drug from getting to the patient. They would make up homemade sets, so every connection that you have in a system is a potential risk for misconnection or deconnections. The drugs that they use are quite powerful um, and some of the plastics that they were using would crack and break. So although TIVA procedure, they were seeing the benefits of it, they were having a lot of problems with the delivery of those drugs to those patients. Historically, Anaesthetists were cobbling together bits of equipment that they have within their store cupboards with on their shelves just to be able to practice this technique. However, through studies and adverse conditions, anaesthetists came to us and we worked very closely with them in giving them a dedicated fit for use product. Yeah, there are a number of um, products out there that require surgeons to use both hands replacing the need for a surgeon to have three hands. So a lot of those innovations looks to try and make the surgeon's life as easy as we possibly can do. We work very closely from day one with the clinicians, with the end users, because we need to satisfy a need of theirs that is yet to be satisfied. We communicate and work very closely through every step of our processes in order to ensure, one, that we are getting a product that one is satisfying an unmet need and it's what clinicians want, but that we are legally, of, legally in a position to be able to manufacture and sell it. We have a very dedicated new product introduction process that has very precise steps and pathways that we must follow. So from a marketing perspective, we have our boxes to tick with is this product what the clinician wants? Will it do what the clinician needs it to do to give good patient outcomes? And from a regulatory process, it is, you know, is it legal? 
um, are, what are the patient ri risks to the patient going to be? And they ensure that we are ticking all their boxes and vice versa. So our working relationships and communication is key to that process being successful. Recent innovations in cardiac care are now helping to save lives, preventing the worsening of a patient's clinical condition, while also making practice more efficient. Home monitoring for patients with pacemakers, implantable defibrillators and implantable cardiac monitors allow clinicians to track the progress of the device's status without the patient being physically present in hospital for an examination. Through the use of a wireless communication network, the device can communicate with the hospital and alerts if something is wrong. Home monitoring has really changed the way we can follow up our patients after they've had their pacemaker or ICD. Patients can, instead of having to come up to the clinic to see face to face and have all the journey times and the uh, booking of appointments, waiting for the clinic, now the patient's able to have their, essentially their routine checkups performed at home without them even having to sort of engage with that. It's done automatically by a device from their home. The transmissions are taken from their own pacemaker by a very small portable device that they have at home. Uh, they're transmitted directly to the hospital and uh, a large proportion of the analysis of that is done automatically. So really the key important points when patients are having a problem can be detected and flagged up straight away to the physiologist and to the consultant in charge of that, that patient. And so all being well, no action is required, but if there is a problem, one is alerted immediately rather than having to wait until either that six monthly check or when the patient discovers they've got a problem themselves. Pacemaker has an RF capability so that every night it will download all its diagnostic information um, via the home monitoring box, which will then send it remotely to the internet so we can check every patient daily if necessary. Um, and we can also do all their routine checks through home monitoring rather than physically seeing them in clinic. This enables us to pick up on any issues much more quickly um, and also keep people out of the hospital, which in today's NHS is very important. Major advantages for a patient um, are quite literally that they have the physiology team on their shoulder 24 hours a day, seven days a week. For an example, if we are following a patient with a complex device up every six months, we could see them on the 1st of November and then not see them again to the following April. Um, but something could happen on the 2nd of November that we are not made aware of until they come back in April. With home monitoring, we're able to become aware of the patient's uh, problem or necessity to see us again immediately so we can react much more efficiently. Our efficiency has improved incredibly because of the system itself, where we would spend 25 minutes in a face-to-face -face follow up with a patient. If the patient has a standard normal uh, message that's sent to us, we can see that patient and generate a report within 10 minutes. So now the efficiency is hugely increased. So an individual physiologist can see far more patients. Uh, that has a obvious efficiency saving for the hospital, for the team, and our physiologists can then be employed onto, you're really using their specialist skills at sorting out these problems. So we can monitor far greater numbers of patients and give the benefits to a larger group of the population, the people who really need to have these devices can have excellent care. I think the NHS has really been a leader in adopting these technologies and one of the efficiency drives has really helped us improve that, the fact that we can have more efficient clinics and reduce the waiting time for device checks, reduce the times that patients would have to, for example, be at home with a potential problem with nobody knowing about it. That's all led, that's all important stuff for our patients and I think as a patient-centred service, the NHS has been really at the forefront of recognising the advantages of home monitoring. Although the NHS adopts new innovations vastly, there are still challenges for manufacturers and developers to comply with the standards required. 
With the rise of efficiency and financial cutbacks, the NHS will only adopt products and services which will ultimately provide patients with a 100% guarantee of successful outcomes and improved efficiency savings. The manufacturers need to work closely in collaboration with clinicians and patients to meet the ever-changing demands of healthcare. I think it's very difficult for the NHS to adopt new technology at the moment until it's proven. The financial pressures the whole NHS is under are great and I think that reduces the ability for trusts to invest in unproven technologies. So I think to an extent at the moment we're in a situation where we have to wait for something to be proven before we can invest in it. The NHS has a history of developing new technologies, it has a history of, of leading the way in terms of new ways of diagnosing, uh, imaging for example, um, but I think you know any industry um, that's funded in the way that the NHS is funded uh, has its own unique challenges in its own right. The development of um, healthcare products is, is a well-trodden space, um, so we, we generate proof of concept data, we optimise the technology, um, we use it in, 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 in our lead centre, but then when you really want to bring it out commercially then it is really about getting a number of centres using it and getting that feedback because as you get more users you get a different sort of feedback and better feedback. The biggest challenge is one of a regulatory one and, and quite rightly all products have to be regulated, you have to make sure that you're making what you said you were going to make in the way that you said you were going to make it, it's high quality, it's not going to fail, it's not going to cause patient uh, any harm or issues. It's going to become a lot harder to develop new technologies in the way that we've done it over the past 30 years. So what you'll have to do now is, is do a clinical trial on a product that has a CE mark, but you can't get a CE mark without a clinical trial. Our internal quality controls are very stringent, probably more stringent than the external regulators' controls on us. Um, to give you an example of that, our medical devices, so our pacemakers and our defibrillators, would typically be tested for about 40 or more than 40,000 hours before they're launched into the marketplace. Um, and this, again, gives everybody confidence to ensure that we hit all the safety standards, both internally and externally. I think it's not surprising that we hear, and, and you know, a lot in the press and politicians, key opinion leaders, public health policy makers, uh, talking about healthcare. I think healthcare is a significant issue right across uh, the globe. Um, we are understanding diseases better, but we're also all living longer, um, and getting fatter and all, and, and all those things are having impact in terms of healthcare. Change is something that is a, a big hurdle for, for us to overcome, especially maybe the, the, the older type generation, the more experienced clinicians very much work on the system if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So for something that they have trained with and used for many, many years, don't particularly want to be told that they something else is new and they have to change what they do or their practice. So it's very much about building relationships, building confidence with clinicians and building their confidence in our products to help them get over that barrier and to embrace change. It's imperative that we can all benefit from the new innovations in healthcare. Working collaboratively, clinicians, manufacturers and innovators can ensure a more efficient and reliable healthcare that people can depend on and invest in for future use. The remote monitoring was very much an innovative step. The benefit of that is starting to be shown now in a lot of clinical trials internationally. I think the whole concept of connectivity will certainly drive us through the next 10 to 15 years and that's just with devices and the way that information is managed and handled. I guess as technology develops, healthcare will develop too. Um, and what's integral with that is if we can manage that information properly and quickly, then the ability to detect, predict, and then treat ultimately these healthcare issues will improve as time goes on. We feel in my trust that how monitoring should be more widely used and more heavily evolved as we uh, go into the future. The cardiac physiology teams throughout the UK are very short-staffed um, 
and the only way to move this system forward would be to go with a home monitoring system which allows better patient care but allows us to work more effectively. It's about working smarter rather than harder. If the patient is not the centre part or the cornerstone of any new product you're developing, I'd advise not to do it because no one in their right mind would actually want to take that product on board. Working with clinicians is absolutely key um, and, and, and not just with one but a whole broad set of clinicians um, coming from other areas. I think it's always important to develop new technologies because as we uh, improve our understanding of medicine and disease processes, uh, traditional diagnostic techniques are being left behind. Uh, we always have to bear in mind that we have problems with false positives and false negatives and if we can minimise those with new technologies then that will improve patient care. Patient outcomes, patient experiences have to be at the forefront of everything that we do because patients need to leave hospital feeling better as when they came into hospital. Mm -hmm.